let us look at another method of thinking. So, thinking using analogies. So, all of you know what analogy means. It is um, this word uh, analogy is uh, means the same as let us say a simile. So, you have two situations in which some elements and their relationship to each other is common. So, an analogy enables a look at a situation as an interrelated whole. The great strength of thinking using analogies is that it enables to look at a situation as interrelated whole. Supposing you want to contrast analogical approach of solving problems or looking at problems from analytical approach. So, analytical approach on the other hand dismembers a whole into parts and may destroy the attributes which may pertain to the phenomenon as a whole. So, if in the process of dividing the problem you lose the uh, function of the various parts when they are interconnected and then so uh, this approach will not work. So, that is why in many situations analytical approach does not work. Problems are solved and creative works are generated by transfer of existing ideas to new surroundings. Okay? So, lot of new works or new solutions come from analogical thinking. So, transfer of existing ideas to new surrounding. So, this happens through analogy. right? So, you have one situation which you are familiar with and you uh, have an idea in this situation and now you are faced with another situation a problem and you want to get a solution and you find that some elements of this problem are related in the same way as the familiar situation and so use information that you have about the familiar situation in the problem situation. Now, let us illustrate this thing with examples. So, analogical thinking is in fact uh, the basis of all problem solving that is what some psychologists have said. Some form of analogical thinking is happening at a subtle level whenever you solve problems. Now, I will give examples of some well known and great discoveries using analogy, but it does not mean that the use of analogical thinking is only restricted to great discoveries. Okay? Even small innovations and so on at uh, the level of a common researcher can happen through analogical thinking. So, uh, two great discoveries uh, namely the discovery of matter waves and the discovery of atomic structure happened through analogical thinking. For example, the matter wave was discovered as an analog of the electromagnetic wave and the atomic structure was discovered as an analog of the solar system. Now, let me take the simpler of the two first the solar system and the atomic structure. What is the analogy between them? So, the solar system you have the sun as the center and you have planets revolving around the sun. Now, the orbits are not necessarily circular I have drawn them in some fashion it is only a model very crude model of the uh, solar system. So, uh, people for uh, thousands of years have known about the solar system in this fashion. Okay? They have conceived the planets rotating around the sun. So, this idea existed earlier. Now, they were faced with uh, developing a model for the atom. So, when scientists were trying to develop a model based on observations. So, they had observed uh, various radiations from the atoms and so on and uh, they wanted to put together a model that will explain all the observations. Now, it struck some scientists that hey the big universe is built up like this where there is a central entity like the sun and then you have the planets revolving around the sun. Why cannot a similar scheme exist even at a microscopic level? So, at a macroscopic level there is some arrangement of the universe. Why cannot a similar arrangement exist at microscopic level? So, let me draw the atomic structure on the side that was conceived as an analogy. So, here also you have a central entity in the atom. Uh, we know it consists of neutrons and positive charges. So, the core of the atom is positively charged and you have the electrons revolving around the nucleus. So, starting from a model like this where you have electrons orbiting around a positively charged nucleus, people could explain the observations. Now, here is an example of a discovery through analogy. 
Now one may ask, but then you know how does one conceive of analogies? That itself is an issue, right? Uh, this uh, problem cannot be answered that easily. Uh, this question cannot be answered that easily. Well, it depends on the uh, intellectual level of our uh, uh, our strength of our intellect. But we can improve our thinking if we know that analogies can be used to solve problems. Then we will try to see uh, what kind of analogies can be applied for your given situation. So, let us look at another important uh, discovery through analogies, electromagnetic wave and matter wave. So, the fact that uh, light is an energy in the form of waves was known okay, much earlier. So, for instance, for light or for electromagnetic energy, the wave, wave nature of this energy was known earlier than the particle nature because the wave nature is very evident to our common day to day experience okay, through our senses without any adding without additional equipment we can experience the wave nature of light reflection, refraction, uh, interference and so on. So, through our senses without any additional equipment we can experience. Now, under special conditions people my scientists showed that the electromagnetic energy which we have experienced uh, commonly as wave also has a particle nature. So, the example of that is what is called the photoelectric experiment in which it was shown that light behaves as particles. Now, as far as matter is concerned, the particle nature of matter is much more evident in day to day world. So, uh, two particles colliding with each other and then uh, we can solve the uh, this kind of problem by conservation of energy and Newton's laws and so on. So, the particle nature of matter was is evident to our day to day experience. So, some scientists thought if light can have wave and particle nature, surely there could be situations where matter also can behave as a wave. In a common day to day experience we see matter as particles, but why not matter also have a wave nature. And then there were some aspects uh, observations related to matter which were not explained and the scientists then suggested that those observations could be explained if you regarded matter as a wave not as a particle. So, here is an example of great discovery by analogy. Now, according to psychologists who have studied thinking some subtle form of analogies are always at work in any innovation or any problem solving. In fact, any higher order thinking seems to happen through analogies. In cases like this that I have discussed in these discoveries the existence of analogy as the basis of the discovery is very very transparent and evident. In some other cases this uh, analogical thinking that we may be using may be much more subtle it may not be that transparent, but some form of analogy is used. So, all good problem solvers use some form of analogy to solve problems. Now, here is an assignment I have not put it on the slide before I go on to the prescriptions for improving our thinking. Assignment is a list out four analogies in your area of study that you might have come across. Okay. So, some prescriptions for improving our thinking. In fact, uh, you might have uh, got some ideas about how to improve your thinking from um, our discussions in the morning and also the uh, session in uh, that we had yesterday, but let us put them down in some concrete form. Now, there is one caution about these prescriptions. Some of this prescri uh, these prescriptions which are related to improvement of thinking abilities are not like tablets that can remove your headache. right? So, you take a tablet and within uh, maybe ma matter of hours or even sometimes minutes your headache can be controlled. right? So, these prescriptions if you follow then over a uh, uh, over a uh, sufficiently long period of time only then they will yield results. So, they are these are more like uh, you know Ayurvedic medicines which work over a longer time scale which take longer time to uh, be effective. So, this is a very important point you must note right. 
So, whatever prescription is being suggested unless you practice that for maybe at least a year or so, you will not see a significant change in your thinking. Okay? But definitely, since thinking is a skill, we, uh, we made this point when we started the discussion on productive thinking that since a significant part of good thinking is a skill that can be developed, you can develop your thinking. Right? That is the positive side of it, though it takes time. So, I have just repeated some points that we have made to uh, in the context of making the prescriptions. So, first thing is that creativity is a skill that can be developed by practice and the second creativity is a matter of organizing one's basic skills. So, two things for developing good thinking is practice and organization. Okay? So, for instance, when, what, do you, what do you mean by organization? So, we have uh, said for instance, if you are representing data, you should organize this in the form of table or organize this in the form of graph and so on. So, this idea can be uh, further extended. So, all your thinking you must try to organize, okay, arrange in some order. And another important thing is motivation. So, this is also something that we have stressed. So, motivation is recognized as a crucial factor in development of creativity. Unless you have a strong motivation, you cannot come up with uh, <coughs> creative ideas. So, just to uh, take an example, uh, I mentioned about how uh, a particular uh, person who was a poor farmer and illiterate came up with a very novel scheme of naming his children. So, what is important there? If you see the children were named after uh, Shiva who was uh, a god for this particular person. So, devotion in this case for example, is a strong motivation that was responsible for creativity. So, like this there can be different other motivations, okay? but the point is some strong motivation should be present. Passion for uh, uh, intellectual solving uh, difficult intellectual problems, right? It, it can be a strong motivation for coming up with creative ideas. So, unless there is a strong motivation, you cannot come up with uh, new ideas or be creative. Okay. Then something more specific learn different solutions to the same problem. Now, this is a very, very important thing. I have given an example in an earlier session. So, you can read a book like 100 different proofs of Pythagoras theorem, how the same theorem can be proved in so many different ways. Now, here is a, a one more example that I am giving. Okay? Different solutions to the same problem. I have chosen a particular problem here uh, that namely calculation of pi. Now, I have chosen this problem because it you can uh, many people can understand this very easily. All of us have come across this uh, a thing called pi. right? What is pi? It is the ratio of the circumference to diameter of a circle. Now, what is so uh, interesting about pi? So, you see for uh, thousands of years, the human beings have been fascinated by various shapes that we see in nature. So, we see triangles, we see polygons we see rectangles and uh, we see circles. So, one thing about circles that fascinated uh, people is that all circles look alike. Why is it that all circles look alike? The small circle and a big circle, there is something in the shape that makes you feel that all circles look alike. Now, what is the basis of this perception? So, that is where people found that this feeling is coming because if you take the aspect ratio of circumference to diameter for all circles, this is the same. And it is this sameness of the aspect ratio, ratio of circumference to diameter that is responsible for the perception of sameness in the shape of the circles. Now, this property is not uh, true for all geometrical uh, figures. For instance, all rectangles do not look alike, all triangles do not look alike. Okay? So, therefore, then people wanted to calculate what is this ratio of circumference to diameter. Now, that is how lot of people uh, this problem engaged lot of intelligent minds calculation of pi. Now, it will be interesting to see how so many different methods have been used to calculate this quantity. I want to emphasize here that our goal is not to discuss how pi was calculated, but to discuss different ways of doing an act uh, solving a problem. Okay? So, this is only an illustration for this uh, basic principle of different learning different ways. 
So, so four different ways are illustrated and the results of these methods are illustrated here. Uh, Let us take an approximation such as pi equal to 2 root 2. How was this obtained? So, let us draw a circle. So, I want to find out the ratio of the circumference of this to diameter. Now, I can approximate, I do not know the circumference easily. So, what I will do is, I will approximate the circumference by a different shape namely a square whose perimeter I can use as an approximation for the circumference of the circle. So, I say that the perimeter of this square is approximately equal to the circumference. Now, it is not a good approximation, but you will see how I can improve this approximation. Now, if, if I and the diameter is this, right? this is the diameter. So, the side of the square is equal to the diameter. So, if this is d, then the perimeter p is equal to 4 times diameter. So, now I am using the approximation circumference c is approximately equal to p. So, circumference by diameter is approximately equal to perimeter of the square by diameter that is equal to 4 times d upon d. So, that is equal to 4. Now, I want to get 2 root 2. I just uh, lost track. Let me do another exercise. Yes. Let me put, yeah. let me inscribe a square inside circle. This could be another approximation that I could use. I did not get uh, the 2 root 2 that I wanted, but whatever I got will be useful to develop a accurate approximation. right? So, let us instead of circumscribing a square, let me inscribe a square and use this approximation. So, here if the diameter is d, then I know that the side of this square is d upon root 2. So, following the same approach, the perimeter by diameter is equal to 4 times d upon root 2 upon d, which is same as 2 root 2. Okay? So, if I stick to just uh, this approximation that I have shown where I inscribe a square in a circle, I will get pi as approximately equal to p by d and that is approximately equal to 2 root 2. On the other hand, if I use uh, an approximation where I have circumscribed the square, I will get the value of pi as 4 and now I can put these two numbers together because I know that in one case I am overestimating the perimeter, when I circumscribe a square I am overestimating the perimeter and when I inscribe the square I am underestimating the perimeter. So, I can take the average of the two to cancel out and I will get a even better approximation as pi equal to 4 plus 2 root 2. Oh, okay. So, I will get pi equal to average of 4 and 2 root 2. So, that is equal to 2 plus root 2. Now, you know that pi is 3.14159 and so on and 2 plus root 2 is very close to that. So, this is how using a geometry, a geometrical approach, I can get an approximation for pi and I can actually go on improving the value that I get by replacing the square by polygon of more number of sides. So, if instead of a square, if I use a pentagon, I will get an even better approximation. So, what I get is, I get a value that is more than pi, accurate value. I get another value which is less than pi. Whenever I circumscribe the uh, particular polygon around the circle, I get a higher value of pi and whenever I inscribe 
the polygon inside the circle, I get a lower value and I then take the average of these two. I go on increasing the number of sides, I get more and more accurate values of pi. So, this is a geometrical approach of uh, calculating pi. So, that is what is illustrated here in the uh, in the second line. So, pi lies between 2 root 2 and 4 if I use a square for uh, sub circumscribing and inscribing. If I use a hexagon, I get uh, values as 3 and 2 root 3. So, this is how my higher and lower values will start moving closer to each other as I increase the number of sides and then the average of these two will become much more precise. So, anyway the point is I can use a geometrical approach to calculate pi. Now, there, there is another approach and that is this approach of trigonometric series, infinite series. So, uh, an Indian mathematician called Madhava came up with a series for tan inverse x. Now, this is a little bit more uh, technical. So, it is possible that some uh, participants may not understand, does not matter, it will take only a minute to explain this. If you do not understand, uh, just leave it. The next point will be much easily understandable, right. So, you have a series for tan inverse x, okay. So, it is x minus and so on, right. That is what is the series. Now, in, in this series, you substitute x is equal to 1 and you know that tan inverse 1 is pi by 4. So, that is what is your left hand side. Right hand side also in the series x minus x cube by 3 plus x power 5 by 5, you substitute x is equal to 1. So, you get a series and then you get more and you take more and more terms and you add them up, you will come closer and closer to pi by 4. You multiply the right hand side by 4, you will get the value of pi. So, this is an infinite series approach of getting pi trigonometric series approach right now there is another very interesting method of getting pi the same value now there is a little bit of background to this uh, what is called buffon's needle experiment so buffon is the name of the person who came up with this particular scheme of calculating pi so uh, buffon was a french uh, person who was uh, intellectually very good and also very wealthy. So, it is said that uh, Buffon did not really have to do any work to earn money. So, most of the time he spent in leisure. So, one such occasion he was sitting on a floor which had tiles of this shape, okay, which had tiles you can say parallel lines all equidistant from each other. So, he was sitting on a chair and he was smoking a cigar, accidentally his cigar fell down on this floor, so something like this. And then uh, because the because the person was intelligent, a, a question came up in his mind, right. He said, what is the probability that if a cigar such as his fell on the floor? that the cigar will cross a line. So, for instance, the way I have shown it, it crosses this particular horizontal line. Now, it is not necessary that it should cross. For instance, if it fell like this, it would not cross the line. And then he set about solving this problem. So, you have a particular distance between the two parallel lines and all the lines are equidistant. So, d is the distance and the length of the cigar is let us say L. You are now using this information, he worked out a solution. This is a problem in probability. We are not interested in the details of the solution, right. We are only interested in some features which explain how there can be so many different ways, wide variety of ways to solve a problem. So, depending on the length and the diameter, you get a solution. For the particular case, when the length and the diameter, uh, sorry not the diameter, the distance between the parallel lines. In the particular case, when the length of the cigar is equal to the distance between the lines, he obtained the result that is shown on the slide. Now, uh, this is more popularly called uh, Buffon's needle experiment because instead of the cigar, you assume that, that uh, you have a needle of length L. You know smoking is not good for health. So, people probably replace the cigar by the needle. 
So, what happens if a needle falls on a floor which has parallel lines drawn like this? What is the probability that the needle will cross the any of those parallel lines? So, here is the answer to the question and uh, the answer is cast in the form of pi equal to the right hand side. So, actually uh, in this uh, expression here written here, the drop indicates the uh, dropping of a needle. So, you are repeating the experiment because how do you uh, find out the probability in this case? You would have to repeat the experiment a number of times. So, number of times you throw the needle randomly on the floor and you check whether it is cutting or crossing a horizontal line. So, crossing of a horizontal line is uh, called here as a hit. So, if the needle uh, cross the line, then you will say it is a hit. So, find out how many times the hit occurred and how many times did you drop the needle. So, 2 times the total number of drops by the number of uh, hits is equal to pi or in other words, in fact, his formula was number of hits by number of drops is equal to 2 by pi. This was his formula that he obtained and then it struck him that actually this formula can be used to find out the value of pi. Okay? So, if you rewrite this expression as pi in terms of hits and drops, then uh, you know you can use it to calculate pi. Now, this is something very interesting because uh, all that you need to do to calculate is just sit and throw the needle randomly and increase the number of times that you do this exercise, you will get a more and more accurate value of pi. So, repeating is very simple thing a large number of times. Now, since then actually this method of uh, solving mathematical problems or estimating quantities uh, has been generalized uh, and uh, has wide application and today it goes by the name Monte Carlo method of calculation. Okay? So, you can see how uh, new ideas are generated. If you can try to see how a problem can be solved by different methods. So, in this case we discussed calculation of pi by a geometrical approach or from a trigonometric uh, series or by a statistical approach. right? where you repeat a very simple thing a number of times and calculate the ratio of two quantities, something uh, like a probability. So, here is an uh, example to illustrate uh, learning different ways of solving the same problem. So, you should take it as a, a, as a hint to the kind of things you should be reading or whenever you read your literature kind of things that you must be documenting, you must be looking for. So, hopefully after this session, whenever you read anything, any technical matter, you will try to look at the same matter in so many different ways. You will try to look for different solutions to the same problem. You will try to uh, look for different uh, graphical representations of data and so on okay? and make docu uh, document these ideas. Now, that is what is going to come next the documentation before that uh, this assignment which I gave you earlier learn different ways to the same problem comes is coming here different proofs of Pythagoras theorem. Okay? Now, I will strongly advise you to do these assignments during the course of the next few days because after that your enthusiasm for this sort of things will wane. So, however, if you do these assignments you will be able to sustain your interest in research for a longer time at least uh, 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 your interest in this workshop and you will get more benefit out of it. So, uh, continuing with the prescription. So, solve a problem by different strategies. So, whenever you are faced with a problem, you look at this slide which uh, listed out the various strategies, um, reformulation, representation, graphical representation, tabular representation, logical reasoning, analysis and so on and uh, try to see which of these strategies will work. So, in the beginning you know you will have to do this kind of trials for a number of problems 
until you uh, develop some sort of intuition to just come up with the right strategy for any given situation. So, document analogies as and when you come across them, this is important. Describe at least two analogies you have come across in your area of interest. I think I have already given you the assignment four analogies. Okay? So, you do that. Now, I come to the very important point of note keeping. You want to be creative, you must keep notes. So, what are the advantages of noting? So, noting ideas as they occur helps you to remember them. This is very evident, but what is not very evident to, uh, may not be evident to you, speeds up your thinking. So, noting ideas has an effect on your thinking. Uh, this is based on research in psychology and this is why people are encouraged to write if they want to think better. So, in this case we are talking about noting. Noting is a process of writing. right? So, it speeds up your thinking, focuses attention on your subject. So, your concentration on something that you are thinking about increases okay? and very important finally, it stimulates cross fertilization of ideas. So, you keep notes of various ideas and periodically you uh, go over all those ideas and then you can try to see how you can probably combine merge different ideas to solve a problem that you are uh, looking for in your research, uh, you, whose solution you are looking for in your research. If you do not record your ideas, you will spend all your mental energy trying to res resurrect the old ones. Now, this is a common experience of all research scholars who do not develop the habit of note keeping. So, they will do lot of literature survey and then first time they read one paper and they uh, get some ideas out of it, they feel they will remember. Then they read another paper and then the third paper and so on, but at the end of six months, they suddenly realize that there was a particular idea they came across in some paper and uh, now they want to take a relook at this and they spend a lot of time trying to locate that particular reference. Why? Because they have not <coughs> developed the habit of systematically noting all the references that they are reading and all the ideas that they are coming across. So, this is a very, very important habit that people should develop, research scholars should develop. Then we have been saying that we must uh, develop the right attitude for research. Uh, here is one more attitude, for, we have talked about motivation. Now, here is another attitude, have an open mind. This is very, very important. If you want to get good ideas, you want to be creative, your mind should be open. Now, what is the meaning of an open mind? So, here is again a psychologist definition of an open mind. So, an open mind is one which is receptive to alternate points of view regardless of the present level of commitment to a belief. So, all of us have our own beliefs our own opinions. That is how we are, but we must be receptive to alternate points of view. So, I may have a certain belief and there may be somebody else who may have a completely different uh, or opposite belief. Now, I should be receptive. What does receptive mean? Receptive means I should be willing to listen to the other point of view, even if it does not match with my own. I may not accept, right? but then I must give a reason why I do not accept. Now, the second definition, uh, second aspect of an open mind is also very important. It acknowledges areas of common ground with those who hold alternate beliefs and allows dialogue with someone with opposing views without attacking the proponent of those views. So, normally it is our nature to, if someone does not agree with us, right, we do not like him, him or her, right. So, we do not like to hear criticism. But this is not correct. Really, if you, your mind is open, you will be open to criticism. So, openness means open to criticism. Now, no, there is nothing like openness to praise. All of us are always open to praise, right? What is important is importance is uh, the being open to criticism. In fact, uh, it is experience of uh, all researchers that the negative comments they get on their papers many times are uh, in uh, when the papers are sent out for review and the reviewer gives a critical comment, the critical comments are in many cases responsible for significantly enhancing the quality of work. So, criticism should always be welcome. So, some more uh, prescriptions. Arrange and rearrange what you read or hear from different points of view. So, we have said that uh, creative uh, 
thinking is about organizing your skills, organizing information and so on. So, you have to arrange and rearrange from different points of view. So, information could be arranged in so many different ways. You try to arrange in different ways okay, to see whether a particular arrangement leads you to some novel pattern. Then allow opportunities for cross fertilization of ideas, so as to generate new problem. Now, what are the means by which cross fertilization can be achieved? So, one important uh, method is interaction. So, if a research scholar is one who does not like interaction, always keeps to herself or himself, the chances of getting a new idea okay, would be less. Or in other words, if you interact technically, then the chances of getting good ideas increases. So, interact this means discuss, answer doubts, teach, explain and so on. Therefore, it is a very good uh, thing all of us know as uh, teachers that whenever we teach, we get new ideas. So, it is good to be teaching while doing research. It is good to be answering doubts. So, if you are not a teacher, at least become a teaching assistant and interact with students and answer their doubts. Then set aside time to read in other disciplines, keeping track of what others are doing that seems original. So, wide reading even beyond your discipline is encouraged for a good research scholar. If possible, work in areas outside of areas we are currently learning about. Okay. Now, uh, with this I would like to uh, have some interaction towards the end of this session and take up the next uh, thing of problem finding in a later session. So, we have a session divided to how, how much and what we should read and then where to publish. So, I will discuss this uh, thing of problem finding in that session. So, I want to uh, just remind you that afternoon the first session after lunch will be about communication skills and it is arranged so because there we are going to have an activity where uh, you have uh, participants uh, presenting uh, 10 minute uh, talks. Now, in this activity what we are going to do is we are going to have people present make a presentation and all other participants should carefully pay attention to the presentation. and. Uh, form opinions about strengths and weaknesses, where is the scope for improvement, what is the uh, strength of the presentation and so on. And then we will uh, try to see how the same presentation can be improved. For instance, we will look at the slides and make suggestion as to how a particular statement that has been made there can be shortened or how it could be rephrased for improvement and things like this. And then we are going to uh, list out some common uh, things that should be followed to improve. Uh, oral or written communication. So, this activity will be just after lunch. Uh, we will have a short discussion now with some centers. Uh, yes, Nirma University, Ahmedabad, uh, any question or comments? It is, uh, with this, uh, it is extrapolating uh, the one of the prescriptions, probably the last one, like working in area outside, uh, you know, one's own. Uh, learning uh, uh, one is on uh, uh, presently one is learning about uh, what i would like to say is that we evolve over a period of period of time and uh, you know often we we uh, end up liking you know um, identifying what we like to do actually in terms of research and all so would you i mean i take this opportunity for you to probably recommend this to the relevant uh, department uh, to to you know evolve a policy to allow people as much as it is possible to do even research apart from this prescription in the areas outside you know their present engagements uh, yes actually um, whether you can do uh, research areas um, I mean a PhD in an area outside your uh, research of the same level as you are doing in PhD. Uh, that is probably a, a more difficult question, but uh, you know at least the IITs the trend is that we prescribe for our research scholars some subjects, some courses which are not directly related to their area and they should undergo these courses 
Okay, this is not only for just uh, breadth of knowledge, but also exposing to uh, I mean information. It is not breadth of information alone, because uh, methods used for uh, solving problems and concepts and so on differ in different areas. So exposure to these different concepts is important. Though you may be choose to you know work in a particular area. So this is really uh, very important. Another thing is. Um, you know many times the complaint is that you have seminars which are uh, announced and uh, informed widely, but not well attended. Now this is one of the things I have seen that research scholars will waste their time chatting and so on even if there is a seminar going on somewhere technical seminar, if they feel it is not in their specific area of interest. Right? So if uh, researchers really know that ideas come from other sources than sources other than in your own field. If you know that innovations happen through analogical thinking and so on, then you will be much more motivated to attend technical seminars, which are not in your area of research with actually a positive intention of getting good ideas. Right? So, uh, this is an area where uh, you know this is something that you know people should do if they realize that exposing yourself to areas other than your own actually will improve your chances of doing good research in your own area. Okay, so, I think uh, we are getting delayed for lunch, uh, we can take questions uh, later also.